Welcome to the State of Developer Education, a podcast by Major League Hacking. We explore how technical leaders are creatively tackling the developer education gap to help prepare the next generation of technologists for the real world and build businesses that can adapt to any changes in the technology ecosystem. I'm your host, John Gottfried. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the State of Developer Education. I'm John, and I am so excited to be here for this episode with Titus Winters, who is the principal engineer at Google. How's it going, Titus? Really good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Um, I like to start with all of my guests hearing about their origin stories. So how did you get started in tech and, and computer science? Uh, so in my family, we, we grew up not particularly well off. Uh, and I remember when I was in middle school, uh, it was probably fifth, sixth, seventh grades, uh, my dad for uh, holidays and things would like go to the mall and like buy us like a little you know handful of candies or something like that just to you know mark the occasion. And for whatever reason, I think for Valentine's Day when I was in seventh grade, instead of going to the candy store, he went to the bookstore. And I do not remember what book he got for my little brother, uh, but for me, he got a learn quick basic or learn Q basic now sort of book. Uh, and he had always, you know, thought that computers were going to be super important. Uh, there were always computers sort of in the house, although none of us were particularly expert. Um, that was our one sort of more upper, like more middle class sort of activity. Um, and yeah, so starting like February of that year, like it was just, here's a book, figure it out. And it's pre-internet era. Uh, so that was literally the only resource that I had. Uh, and I remember like just going through that and like typing in the exercises and getting it to run and fixing my typos and not understanding why indentation mattered or like, uh, I remember one of the first like very exciting aha moments was reading through the whole thing on like subroutines functions and being like why would you ever need this this is so weird uh and then it was really you know as so many kids are very into games uh and in the era you know it wouldn't be shocking to have text adventure games like zork and those sorts of things uh and i realized oh if you had a sub program like i had a function represented by a room or I guess the other way around. Uh, and you call that sub program to go into the room. It's like, oh, this is brilliant. And so like I started doing that. Uh, the QBasic interpreter doesn't have tail recursion. So I then, you know, pretty soon ran out of stack space and like had to, yeah. okay. So what do I do now? And it's like, oh, I could have a variable for what uh, what room ID I'm in and then have like a main loop of like which function to go to so I don't call and like, no no accidental recursion stuff like that so that was that was kind of the start of it uh, and then I that was my hobby at least up until college so I, I got a lot of my practice and drill hours in very early so yeah. probably not as high quality as they would have been in a post internet <laughs> era but you know working through it yourself has some value too so you work with what you got. Yep. Um, exactly. I uh, I have very fond memories of text-based games. A lot of my early hacking projects were on MUDs, which mm -hmm. you know people don't yep. really remember anymore. But I love them. Yep. 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 I had a friend that was trying to like restart some of that uh, culture when we were in uh, undergrads uh, in college, and I remember writing a bunch of little pieces for that too. Yeah. yeah. Good so, times. Uh, I'm curious, like, when was the first time you encountered another programmer? Um, probably shortly after that initial book. It was probably late seventh grade, early eighth grade. Like, there were a couple other programmers, nerds, whatever, uh, in school with me. And so I remember we, like, had a little club and swapped disks. And I, I think we... Uh, had a rule that like in order to be part of the club you have to buy a box of discs because <laughs> we know that we're going to just like hand things off back and forth yeah so that's great um 
So you said that it was a hobby um, all the way through college. Uh, you know, once you started your your sort of like formal education, um, how, how did that compare to learning on your own? I, th I mean, I think clearly having all of the on your own experience uh, makes it a lot easier to digest the material, the lessons that you're being given. Um, uh, as a, you know, as an educator, I often say, like, it's very hard to be given a solution to a problem you don't realize you have. And I think that makes, especially like uh, intro and, and undergraduate education in computing, sometimes a little challenging. Uh, so because of all of the things that I tried and didn't know how to do or tried and like failed at, uh, it on the one hand made that a lot more like fertile and, and easy to kind of engage with. Um, some of it still felt like, well, that's kind of weird and esoteric. Uh, I was I was definitely less interested in the more theory heavy uh, pieces in my undergraduate experience. You know, classes on theory uh, or programming languages, those sorts of things. Uh, in retrospect, those became a lot more valuable, uh, but it that was that was a little hard to engage with for me. It, it's really interesting to hear that from from you in particular, right? Because you're so involved <laughs> with language design and curriculum development and all of these different things that to me, you know, signal you care a lot about the internals and the underlying foundational theory. Like what, what eventually like lit that spark? <laughs> um, I think it was kind of a matter of just right place at right time as much as anything else. And I've always been very interested in, uh, or at least uh, when I was, after I finished in grad school, I've always been drawn towards sort of providing better infrastructure, uh, better APIs and, and like uh, all of those sorts of things. And um, the side effect of that is I don't come at a lot of these things like being, you know, on the C++ standards committee as, wow, this is the best tool. I absolutely love this tool. It's, this is the tool that we have. This is the tool that we need to use. Let's make sure that we can use this tool better and more effectively. And uh, I think that's actually one of the, the marks of good engineering in particular is to be willing to use the right tool for the task. And like, certainly you're gonna prioritize the things that you know or are more familiar with, like those are top of mind and you know within arm's reach. But in the end, like, I'm not gonna get into language debates, like it's a tool, you use the tool for what it's good at. And um, I, I happened to just kind of keep drifting lower in terms of like, okay, let's, let's fix the lower, the next lower piece of infrastructure. Let's explain the next lower piece here and then wound up spending, you know, five years serving on the C++ standards committee. It's a side effect. So. Interesting. So it was almost kind of like <laughs> incidental, but not, not your initial goal. Yeah. Um, how, how did that turn into work on computer science education and curriculum in a broader sense? Right. Um, so I think that it went as um, shortly after I got to Google, like the second team I was on, was C++ core libraries. And I was one of the first two engineers on this. It was kind of a new idea. And it was originally pitched as a lot of the like very, very early, very senior engineers are still listed as the owners for like infrastructure that they had to write in order to, you know, put out the first generation of Google search. And they have better things to do than to review changes to those like old, you know, cache routines or string manipulation routines. So our team was chartered to take over that sort of infrastructure. And then I realized pretty quickly like, oh, we own kind of the vocabulary that you write programs at Google out of. Maybe we should tell people how to use that. And maybe we should also try to improve that. And that therefore became both a little bit of education because we wanna tell people where it is and how to use it well and uh, interesting and, and I think novel at the time work on how do you refactor things at scale? Uh, and those kind of proceeded in, in parallel. 
Um, and the education thing was always close to me. Uh, my graduate work was in uh, computer science, but it was applied AI in educational domains in particular. And my thesis advisor didn't actually have any money to run graduate students, but he was the department chair. So he just asked me to teach every class that they had a gap <laughs> in the roster. So I taught a ton and the, the educational bias was already there. Uh, and then skipping ahead to Google, uh, we're doing more like guidance and best practice and, and all of that. And then figuring out how to refactor at scale. And when you're refactoring at scale, you wind up bumbling into everybody's code and seeing what they're doing. And you especially see what they do that's overly clever or wrong. And so I had this weird, like very broad, very shallow experience of the hinkiest, like funkiest, most unnecessary clever pieces that anyone had written in 10 years. Uh, and that gave kind of an interesting context and perspective. Um, and then a few years later, uh, we sat down to write the software engineering at Google book, partly justified by the fact that uh, me and the, the other primary uh, curators, contributors to the book had been on that team that were like amongst the first ranks of people that had touched everybody's code and seen all of the mistakes. And we're like, we've, we haven't made all of the mistakes ourselves, but we've seen what happens when you do this wrong. Uh, so let's try to codify that. And so then from there, like, oh, okay, now this is just software engineering practice and principle. And like, can we codify the theory there? And, and then still with an educator hat on, I'm like, sure would be nice if I could get more of that into undergrads and people that hadn't made it to Google yet. Like, that'll make my life so much easier in five years. So a roundabout way, but yeah. So what are some of those things that you're trying to get into undergrad, right? Because I think, you know, everyone has a lot of different perspectives, especially now on what that yeah. should contain. Yeah. Um, this is an interesting and deep and I think very open question. Um, and a, a year ago, uh, there's a keynote that I gave at IDC, one of the large CS Ed conferences, um, that was specifically kind of saying, industry needs to chill. Like, we can't assume that you're going to know everything based on an undergraduate degree or, or a boot camp or, or anything else. Like, we have to admit that ongoing education is, is a thing and, and is part of our responsibility. Um, but also computing has gotten so large, like you can't have a survey in every meaningful topic and come away with anything. Like you have at most a tiny flavor of it, right? But taking a whole class in networks or compilers or software engineering is about the same amount of time as you're gonna spend in like three weeks or a month on the job. And like, that seems weird that we're gonna try to cram everything you need to know into, you know, a year worth of, you know, real life experience, like that's not how that's going to work. And so I think one of the, the really dominant questions for CS uh, right now is what are the things that are essential? Uh, and to my mind, a lot of it is drill. Like I think we, we underestimate how many hours of practice it takes to be a fluent programmer. Uh, and the other really big one is not any particular technology or language or any of those things, but if you're gonna be a software engineer, you need to be a decent person, right? It's teamwork, it's communication, it's, right? Uh, because the, the era of, you know, one lone genius in a garage, if it ever existed, it's definitely over. Like now it's gonna be a team effort and no one wants to be on a team with a bunch of jerks or even one jerk. Uh, so like uh, if we could get undergrads that were more fluent, like more drill, more the basics and just kind of had a little bit of awareness of like the need of, you know, uh, collaboration, communication, teamwork, I'd be thrilled. Uh, a little bit more like, please write tests would be lovely, but you know, I'll, I'll fight that. Uh, that's, that's kind of a cherry on top, I guess. Yeah. 
how do you square that need for teamwork and collaboration with a lot of the sort of ingrained academic distaste for learning as a group, right? Like you hear these horror stories of professors, yeah. you know, disqualifying people for cheating because they collaborated right. on GitHub, right? Like, right. Um, these days, it's harder and harder to square those. Um, I, I've started describing it as, are we a math or are we a craft, right? Because a lot of the undergraduate groups evolved out of math departments and you, you kind of see it and it's in our, it's in our genes, you know, but also the way that you structure all of the, you know, first couple years of uh, assignments and classes uh, and often the whole program is kind of a little mathy, right? You're like, here's a formal specification of the thing I need you to produce. Go do that thing. Right. And we sort of talk about it and give lip service to it as the craft of it all. But we primarily assign things. And then the tech industry primarily interviews based on, can you solve this tricky math problem effectively? And this is all going to have to change kind of immediately because, you know, the ML revolution right now, the bots are real good at doing the math part. They're, they're no good at doing the craft part yet. Uh, and so like we, we really have to change focus, uh, years ago, but you know, immediately, uh, both in terms of what undergrads are being focused on and how we, how we vet people, you know, entering the industry. And that's going to be hard. Uh, I think I would lean more towards things like art studio and like critique, uh, if we can find ways to do that without it becoming toxic, um, because it can't just be this like auto grader, perfect objectivity nonsense. Like that part of the job is being automated as we speak. Uh, that's not where we should be focusing. Um, so. Yeah, it certainly seems like from from my perspective that uh people who are really excited about their craft as programmers find those opportunities to get feedback and interact with others yes. around code right and that yes. could be things like hackathons could be presenting mm -hmm. at a meetup could be being yeah. a class like there's a lot of different methods but um it seems like a necessity that's not really like directly integrated into your uh academic requirements right now right. Yeah, exactly. And the, the, the schools and the programs that I'm most excited by are the ones that have the most investment in co-ops and internships yep. and like getting those sorts of real world experiences. Um, I'm part of the effort that's currently a joint ACM and IEEE and AAAI, like what should undergraduate curriculum requirements look like? And uh, the, I, I, we're asking the question, should we require all CS grads to be on a project course? And who do we exclude if we do that? And that's not an easy question. And as a, as an industry professional, like I'm a little nervous about that requirement. Uh, also because you know how no teams work in industry. Let's form a team out of people that have never been on a team and nobody has any more background than anybody else in this problem and go try to solve the thing. Like, that's going to give you absolutely the wrong taste. But then the other answer of no, we're not requiring any project work is also terrible. So I, 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 I don't know, like this is uh, there. I don't see an easy answer here. It's very complicated. But. Yeah. I mean, it seems like the value of things like co-ops, right. Are largely in the mentorship yeah. and I don't know what that would look like if it were part of a curriculum or, or part of your course assignments, yeah. but like, it feels like there is something there that you could have project-based work and could have someone who knows best practices. I, I don't know that those people are professors though, right? I, I, right? I've had some incredible professors, but a lot yeah. of them haven't worked in industry for a really long time. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the 
it is more effort to teach an art than to teach math, you know? Uh, it, the scaling properties are just different and, and harder, and I don't know that we're equipped for that. And then to your point, a lot of the professors, you know, if they have industry experience, it's been a while. Um, I often ask the question, how different would our industry be if we had evolved over 250 years instead of 50, right? Because a lot of the, you know, engineering director types uh, within the industry or department chair types in academia have been out of the game for 10 years, which doesn't sound like that much, but it's also 20% of our history. Uh, so like, yeah, we, we evolved pretty quickly. Like, are you caught up? Um, and yeah, it, there's a lot of really strange aspects to being in tech and, and thinking of these questions. Do you think that as the standards evolve and as the expectations evolve, that the craft of software or programming and the theory and mathematics of it are potentially on a path to become separate disciplines, right? Like when I look at something like boot camps, you know, they're teaching the craft, but maybe not the theory and yeah. academia might be the opposite. Yeah. I, no, I, I certainly see some of that and I don't know how that's going to land. Um, there's, a, there's an open question to me, whether in 10 years there will be uh, a major emphasis on having separate software engineering degrees instead of just computing degrees or whether CS will shift to be more practical and then there'll be a theoretical CS degree. Um, and both are quite valuable uh, in, in different contexts. Like Lord, like I already talked about tail recursion just offhandedly, uh, yeah. you know, having those things as vocabulary is really useful. Right, the explanatory power and the understanding that comes with having that exposure. Yeah, I, I can't say that that's, that's nothing by any means. Uh, I, yeah, man, I don't have the answer. Like, <laughs> it's, it's a difficult problem. Um, yeah. I, I want to like dig in a little more on this idea of treating technology as more of an art than a science. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious what that looks like in your experience. Like, like what are some experiences that have reflected that perspective in, in a real sense? Like, so much of what I see as interesting in tech is uh, drawing connections or spotting an opportunity or uh, finding a clever novel way to apply an existing solution to a new problem, right? And those are entirely distinct from the formalism and the theory that we're most likely to encounter in like formal specification and, you know, uh, theory approaches to these things. Um, I, we spend a significant amount more time working on how do you deal with like cash locality and efficiency uh, in terms of like small optimizations and performance tweaks than we do talking about big O in practice, right? Um, and so like, I think that the practicality versus theory gap has already been there and is, is sort of growing. Uh, it's just that the, the ML is gonna make it really, really extreme, really quick because all of the little things like run of the mill code with like clear inputs and outputs, that's no longer going to be our meat and potatoes coming up with how do we assemble those in higher level, more interesting ways. I don't know that the ML is going to do that for us, at least not for, you know, several years longer than it takes for it to, to take over, you know, doing the basic coding. Um, and I think when you look at where generative AI is going in other domains, you kind of see that too. I mean, I know that AI art is kind of a hot, you know, difficult topic for a lot of people. Uh, but like you, if you look at how those are structured, you know, you have a prompt, like I need, I'm 
I need to tell the, the system what I'm looking for with you know, as much granularity as it takes to get the result that I'm looking for. And that means we need to up-level our ability to talk about design. And okay, design is an art word, not a, not a math word, right? And, and I just don't see any way that in five years, uh, one of our primary tools isn't one of these generative AI systems with, I tell you what I need here and it generates you an implementation and some tests and you kind of iterate until it's, this is the piece that I need. And then it's on you to, you know, glue that together and into the, the bigger piece that you're actually looking for. How much foundational knowledge do you think someone will need to know if that output is even correct though? Like, like that seems to be the, the problem yeah. of the minute, but I don't know how that will evolve. I don't either. Uh, I think I mean, there's plenty of you know research and scholarship on uh, automation bias is one of the things that terrifies me right now. It's like if a machine says it, then we assume that it's correct. Yeah. And we're gonna have to be awfully careful with these systems for a little bit uh, until the quality is actually higher. Um, but it's it's gonna go that way. Uh, I'm reassured a bit when if you look at it like copilot where yeah. it's you know effectively complicated autocomplete mm -hmm. i don't know where that goes like I, that feels like it's very handy and it's a you know accelerant but it's a evolutionary dead end like how much faster can i specify a prefix of what i'm looking for and right. you know get to the end point whereas eventually it's going to have to be like intent like here is what i need in broad terms and once it shifts to intent synthesize the tests too mm -hmm. right and anyone that's spent a bunch of time in code review should be able to tell you like yeah you probably want to go read the tests first like to see what the behaviors are intended to be like what are we like what what are we doing here yeah and then you could go read the implementation and i think with those as checks and balances on did I specify the right thing and did you do the right thing and now I have an implementation and tests maybe that'll work uh, I'm at least moderately excited to see where that goes but yeah me too yeah um, I'd love to hear a little bit about the actual process for evolving standards and curriculum like <laughs> you're part of this working group yep I've been on enough open source mailing lists and groups to understand that, you know, when you get a bunch of technical people together, it's interesting. I I'm curious what the process actually looks like to like discuss, define, and perhaps roll out, you know, evolutions to uh, expectations for something like curriculum. Yeah. Um, it's a big group. Uh, so we've kind of broken down computing into I want to say 20-ish sort of subtopics. Uh, these are can, called knowledge areas. Um, there's a couple people that run the overall product or project as a leader from ACM and a leader from IEEE. Uh, and then we have delegated subject matter experts for all of the knowledge areas. And that's kind of the steering committee. And so big questions, things like, hey, are we willing to let CS and software engineering divert or diverge rather? Uh, if no, then we do want to consider this like project based learning requirement. And if yes, then, then we'll do something else. Uh, and so the steering committee and, and those little, those ACM and IEEE leads are, kind of responsible for trying to answer those big sort of philosophical questions. Uh, and then each knowledge area has sort of a subcommittee of hopefully a mix of academics and industry reps uh, that looks in detail at like, all right, what are the subtopics in here? What are the topics that we're trying to hit? How much time are we willing to commit to those things? Uh, and so far it hasn't been 
as much of a like bitter, no, mine is more important than yours fight as I would have feared. Um, but I, I think it is also the case that uh, the writing is on the wall. We're, we're over budget on the amount of hours that we are currently requiring versus how much a small program can actually, you know, uh, require for their, their graduates. Um, so it's possible that it becomes a little bit more uh, heated. Yeah. But for the most part, it's a bunch of people that know their material very, very well, uh, that are really a very good group of people. Like I've, I've been really pleased at those interactions. I really enjoy hanging out with them. Most of that, like we started over Zoom because I think the kickoff was... I think the kickoff was summer 2020 um, and we just had our first like in-person meeting last summer here in New York and we had a second meeting in Puerto Rico fairly recently uh, trying to hash out some details um, so mostly it's some mailing list stuff and you know zoom meetings and yeah nothing nothing shocking but did this come out of the the pandemic or, or is this already in the works before? Like, cause you said summer 2020, that makes me think it's responsive to something, but was it? No, I think it was just timing. Uh, cause they've done, uh, similar documents going back roughly every 10 years, uh, back, I think into the eighties, uh, maybe even earlier than that. But the previous one was, is called CS 2013. You can see yeah. it if you hunt for it online. Um, Within software engineering, like my major switch is a lot of the 2013 requirements feel very much like we're trying to make you into a project manager. I'm like, mm. can we please focus on stuff that's going to be useful for new grads day one? Right. Yep. I'm not even saying you're going to industry for sure, like industry or academia, but like new grad is the target. Uh, project management is great. Formal methods are great. Like there's all sorts of stuff that counts as software engineering that is is worth studying. Those are not the same as this is what I want to subject all undergrads to. Like, yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, when you think about the actual like uh, implementation of this, you know, <laughs> we started off at the beginning talking about C plus plus and your work on C plus plus standards. Um, I, I know a lot of people who have you know, different perspectives on learning, you know, C++ or, or Java in school, right? <laughs> sure. Some of them love it. A lot of them don't. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, a lot of people would be way more excited to write JavaScript. But, you know, how do you think about that conceptually of what a, I'll say, lower level language like C++ can teach versus something that's more abstracted away, you know, uh, up the stack? Right. So... By and large, the requirements process is not is trying to be agnostic on those questions because those have always been like hot button, like third rail sort of topics for a lot of departments. Uh, it's really hard to tell them that they're teaching it wrong. Um, interestingly, uh, two things I think are maybe starting to shift that a little bit. Um, I think Python has been dominant for so long that like teaching Python seems like a pretty obvious thing. And I am a big fan of Python as an intro language specifically because um, when I was a grad student, I at one point surveyed CS1 like first day, uh, first class students for like, what do you think programming is? And an awful lot of that was references to the matrix or movies like hackers, you know, like they don't really know. Right. And so going from that to say Java for an intro class, like public static void main string brackets, brackets are right. Uh, this is not the sort of magic that is going to like really engage people. Whereas with Python, you have to tell them, okay, print doesn't necessarily mean print to a printer. And uh, quotes mean what they would mean in English and uh, parenthesis uh, if you're teaching in Python 3. Like Python 1 or 2, you didn't even need the parens on print statements, even easier, right? And so like 
I really, I personally am a big fan of learn to be an algorithmic thinker first, and then you can tackle how does the machine actually work and by a syntax heavy sort of deeper languages, right? I have nothing against, you know, learn a Java, learn a Kotlin, learn a Rust, learn a C++ at some point. Absolutely, right? Different tools for different tasks. Uh, I think it's a little harsh to like try to do CS1 in C or C++. Uh, I think there is new ammunition in that particular argument though, which is uh, the news from last fall that like branches in the US government kind of came this close to saying, please stop writing C and C++. The memory safe issue is just too significant, uh, which if that doesn't start convincing schools, like go, if you need something low level, go to Rust, right? But like, stop with this, like this is not the right place to start. So we'll see. I don't know. Yeah, I think we'll we'll find out. It does seem like Python is becoming a lot more prevalent, though, and that's yeah. probably for the best. It is, and I think that the AP classes or the AP tests are moving to Python, uh, which I think is a is a good step too. So yeah, I heard that. I I have uh, unfond memories of doing it in. I think it was Java at the time, but but we also had a Visual Basic class. <laughs> yeah, I think when I took it, it had. It was either Pascal or C++. It might have been Pascal still. So. They had C++ for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Um, I'm curious, like, the, the, the working group, does um, the idea of, like, making computer science more inclusive or diverse, like, factor into curriculum yes. at all? Like, oh, how yeah. does that play Huge. into curriculum? Huge. Um I think the topic area that has expanded the most uh, by like, I want to say at least double uh, is, forget what exactly it was called in the 2013 requirements, but currently we're calling it society ethics and professionalism. And it's sort of like, hey, be a decent person, right? Uh, and that one, we almost hesitate to call it a distinct knowledge area. Like we don't want it to be a class on its own. We want it to be threaded through everything um, because it's better for society. It's better for our industry. It's better for people. Like you have to be a good person. It is at least as important to be a good person as a good programmer. Um, and I, the, the committee I think is completely unanimous on this point. Uh, it is, it is long past time for us to, admit that we have an outsized influence on the world and to step up and act right. Um, so I think that we're trying to do all of the right things. That is, that is hard, especially through a, a mechanism that is a, as blunt as curriculum requirements. Um, but a lot of the ideas are really simple things. Like there's great studies on uh, you have better retention for underrepresented groups if you stop asking things that are entirely just abstract, right? Instead of it being a question about, you know, binary trees or nary trees, uh, just flavor the question to be about family trees, right? And then you can also raise the interesting, like, ethical and moral and societal questions of, like, all right, how many parents do you have? <laughs> Like, do you have uh, binaries on like gender in there? Like, I'm not going to say that there's one correct answer in that. Uh, you know, those are those are topics that people can have some difference of opinion. But if you're not asking the question, you're definitely doing it a disservice, right? Yeah. And yeah, like you just threading culturally relevant and real world sorts of things throughout the, the curriculum would would be a big step. So again, craft, not so much math. Yeah. One of the things that we've seen a lot over the years, because a lot of our programs are not CS specific, even though they are very technical, is that, um, you know, for at any given event, um, 
far more of the attendees who are still programmers. Mm -hmm. um, but if they come from an underrepresented group in tech, like let's say people who don't identify as male, mm -hmm. they are significantly more likely to have a different major. So yeah. even if they're at this hackathon building complex software, they might be studying something totally different because of a million different societal reasons going yep. back to their childhood and what toys they were given. Like there's all these things, right? Yep. Yep. But, you know, there's almost no gap in what people are able to produce, but there's a huge gap in what they choose as their major. Yep. Um, and it's a really, really interesting, like, question of like perception of the field and, <laughs> and yep. you know, all of the things you're talking about of making it more relevant and relatable to, to a lot of different people. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, for undergrad, I went to Harvey Mudd. And yep. when I was there, the ratio in computer science was like 10 guys to every woman. It was bad. And that was three or four times worse than the general population of the school, right? Which was already not great. Um, these days, even in CS, they're at basically parity. Uh, sometimes there are classes where the women outnumber the men. And one of the things, as I understand it, that made a huge, huge difference in that is teaching first class, first year students how to be a decent student. Yeah. Right? Like, and the, the step that they took in particular was if you have any experience in this, we're putting you in a different section to reduce the, ooh, I know the answer because I'm three years ahead of you, right? Which, let me tell you, that's a turnoff for everyone that wants to participate, but is just joining up, right? And so just literally put them in a different room, teach the same material, right? And the side effect of that was like wildly increased retention in a small number of years. And like those things, uh, media focused computation classes. Uh, Mark Gazdial did amazing things in the early 2000s and the 2000s at uh, Georgia Tech, um, Barbara Erickson, et cetera. Like there is a lot of work in the like CS education community on like approaching these issues. Uh, but in the end, like some of it starts with just trying to change the the vision of, yeah, it's just, white guys sitting in a dark room, like being mean to each other. Like, yeah, no, it, that this, this should not be, should not be where we're at. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, cool. Well, so I, I'd be curious to, to, before we end here, hear if you have any like personal anecdotes about teaching and helping people learn these skills. Cause I know you've done a lot of that at Google in terms of internal upskilling. You know, you also had a brief stint, uh, you know, lecturing and being a professor yeah. when you're doing your PhD. Right. Um, what, what are some of the like really inspiring stories that you think of uh, where you helped someone learn? So I think my favorite, like, I think my favorite piece in education is uh, do more live like show failure. Like I taught operating systems classes with you know, like a page of notes and a Python interpreter and a projector uh, and be like, okay, we're going to learn about system calls and processes and file descriptors and stuff. I'm just going to do this live. We'll probably screw it up because I'm just doing it live. But one of the side effects there is like, it's entirely too easy for undergrads to graduate without ever actually witnessing a skilled programmer do the task, right? If we were teaching art or music and we're like, this is what we need you to produce, but we're not going to show you the process of doing it. Like there's nonsense on the face of it, right? But either because of, I don't know, performance fear or the amount of time that it takes to do these things or whatever, like, lots and lots and lots of our graduates never actually see that it is normal to screw up. And this, I think, contributes hugely to the imposter syndrome that so many of us have, guilty as charged, 
uh, and to kind of the general sort of do-it-yourself toxic sort of environment that we, we've kind of built for ourselves. And so uh, to my mind, one of the really, really important things is to find those internships and mentorships and to pair program and to have your instructors and lecturers and professors do it live. And if it doesn't go well, that's a success. Like you might not have taught the topic at hand, but you taught the more important thing of, yeah, this stuff is hard. Uh, and it's hard by definition. It's going to always be hard. If it was easy, we would have automated it already. Right? Like the nature of our discipline is to do things that are just on the edge of what we can do because everything easier has already been handled and everything harder is impossible. Right? Like we just live in that gray zone. So. Yeah, I, I would love for every CS class to have a module on debugging. Like, <laughs> yes. Because like, I, I mean, I sit with students sometimes and they don't know Stack Overflow exists, you know? And it's like, th there's almost like a, a, I need to memorize this, you know, and, and internalize every aspect yeah. of what I'm doing. But you're right, like watching someone code you know, like they might spend 30% of their time Googling the answer yeah. uh, and that's okay, but you don't necessarily know how to do that, you know, coming into it fresh or even how to structure your query. Yeah, exactly. And like learning those tricks of how to ask the right question or like how to question your assumptions, like yeah. that, those things are not covered in a lot of curriculum. I'll say yeah. that. So, yeah. Um, Outside of, you know, the, the work that you've done directly, are there any folks like in the industry right now who you think are doing really innovative or creative educational work for, for technical people? Um, my favorite, as far as like academic and, and undergraduate work, uh, I already mentioned Barbara Erickson and Mark Guzdial. Uh, they're now at University of Michigan, I think. Yep. Um, and their work is phenomenal. Uh, Amusingly, my wife is taking a data science master's and their like Python refresher stuff was all Barbara Erickson's uh, like system for how to learn Python. Oh, wow. And, and so I kind of got to watch over her shoulder like that in, in light, in real life. I was like, dear Lord, that is so well constructed. Like this is beautiful material. Um, so those things are great. Um, uh, it's less visible for everyone else, but I think it's representative of where stuff's going to go. Um, I've been working really closely with George Fairbanks, who writes for IEEE in mm -hmm. software architecture and things like that. Um, we're teaching internally classes on design and testing uh, together, and it is fascinating because whereas it happened initially that we were just teaching those because those were the two things we happened to know, yeah. uh, as we, as as we learned what the other was talking about, we're like, oh, this is like physics and calculus. This is like peanut butter and chocolate. Like this is, these are actually kind of the same thing and you can't really separate them. Uh, and so that's been really exciting. And I fully expect eventually uh, material from George and I on both of those topics will start to drift out into the rest of the world as we find time to write it and find forums to publish it and stuff. But yeah, yeah some, I would be really excited to read that. There's some there's some cool stuff in there. Uh, yeah, for sure. So. That's awesome. Um, well, thank you so much. Uh, I only have one more question. It's the question I like to end on for for everyone. Uh, are there any like aspirational figures in science or tech that you've never had the chance to meet that if you could just have an hour of their time and pick their brain about how they see the world, like who who might those people be? Yeah. Uh, and now I'm drawing a, I can see her face. And now I'm drawing a blank on her name. Oh, 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 that's, um, uh, let me look this up. Uh, oh, what's her name? This will obviously be edited. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's okay. Mary Shaw. Yeah, 
Uh, Mary Shaw is kind of a long-term figure in software engineering. She teaches at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, one of the talks that I go back to pretty regularly is she has a talk, uh, progress towards computing engineering as a discipline or some, some combination of those things. And she talks about the development of uh, mechanical engineering, right? Like we, and bridge building is kind of the example that she uses. Like we've had bridges for thousands of years. We started like just doing that kind of randomly. We learned some lessons. Eventually those lessons started informing physics and we started studying like the natural laws and all of that. And then the practical branch of that became like mechanical engineering. And over thousands of years, we've now gotten to the point where you know, a department of transportation has a program where you enter in like soil types and, you know, gap length and like road base width and like traffic parameters. And like, they're like, boop, design me a bridge. Okay, done. Uh, obviously we are not that robust yet. Uh, but the point of, yeah, well, it's only been 50 years. Like this, this does matter. Uh, give us a little little bit of time there uh, is is really relevant. So like I, especially as a software engineer and you know as a label that I like, uh, yeah, Mary Shaw is is way up there. So. Awesome! I, I'd actually love to check that out. I hadn't heard of that before. Good talk. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I, I really appreciate you spending the time. And honestly, I, I found this very. Um, inspiring and it made me optimistic that people are having these conversations that you're describing <laughs> yeah yeah i don't know that they're going anywhere yet it, but <laughs> yes but we're it, you just got to start with talking about it so yeah, yeah for well, sure th thank you for the work you do and for for you know sharing this with us um uh we'll include some links to your work in the uh show notes and hopefully folks enjoyed listening um, definitely, you know, like it and subscribe. We're going to be doing a lot more uh, of these. But um, thanks again, Titus, and, uh, you know, happy hacking. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Good luck, everyone. Be well out there. The State of Developer Education is brought to you by Major League Hacking or MLH. To find out more about MLH and how we power innovation, cultivate developer communities, and teach technical skills to students around the world, visit mlh.io. And then make sure to search for developer education in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Make sure to click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Don't forget to like and review the show, and we'll give you a shout out on a future episode. On behalf of the team here at MLH, thanks for listening and helping us empower the next generation of technologists. Happy hacking.